Well, good morning. My name is Sammy. I'd like to welcome you to the legacy service here at Celebration Church. As we enter into worship today, there's a lot going on in our country, and we should be praying for our leaders, our country, for peace, for justice, and whatever God wants to do in the world according to his original design. Let's begin our worship this morning with this scripture. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Papa, thank you that we can consider it all joy in this time. And even in times of trial and um, all the uncertainty and all the confusion and all the anger and the injustice that's happening in the world, we know that we can consider it all joy because of our faith in you and because you're moving. Thank you that your spirit is moving in us, in our world, in our families, in our friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now we are going to hear some special music from Ray and Sherry Serna. The psalmist said, the Lord is my strength and my song and ever-present help in trouble. Let us praise God in song and worship. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I lift my voice and sing. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Because of who you are, I will not worry. Because of who you are, I will not fear. Because of who you are, I sing my praise to you. And I thank you, Lord, because of who you are. You are the one. Rock and firm foundation, refuge and strength, my help when trouble comes. You fill my heart with songs of praise for you. Jesus, you are the one. Though the waters roar and the mountains quake, though they slip into the sea, if the earth should change, I will not fear. You're my strength when storms appear. You are the one. You are my Lord. And say good. You are the one, the one who loves me so. You are the one, the one who died for me. Jesus, you are the one. You are the You're the maker, maker creator, creator, the master of all things. You're my refuge, refuge redeemer, redeemer, the shepherd of my heart. Oh, Jesus, say
before we pray for our missionary family of the week, there are a couple things we want you to know. First of all, we want to congratulate and celebrate David Kissay on his graduation from the University of California, Riverside. Yay! So if you'd like to give a word of encouragement or a word of congratulations to David Kissay, you could do that. Put a note along with your offering to Celebration Church, um, and he would be happy to hear from you, and we'll make sure that that gets to him. We have a brief reminder here that there's three ways to give here at Celebration Church. Uh, one is by text and phone, another by our website, and a check in the mail. Um, the information is on the screen, so go ahead and um, choose what your preference is. And another announcement, if you would like to come and sit on our taping for the Legacy Worship Service, you may join us starting Saturday, June 27th at 9.30 a.m., in our worship center. So today we are going to pray for the Fox family serving as missionaries in Spain. Join me in prayer and as we also pray for our country today. Papa God, thank you for the Fox family and the way that you're moving in them in this time. Uh, thank you for your spirit at work in Spain. We just pray for the Fox family and their ability to learn Spanish in their studies at language school um, for that supernatural help that you can give them. Pray for their, uh, we pray for their identity to be rooted in Christ as we make many decisions that are uh, ahead of us and as they make decisions. Uh, pray for the spirits, we pray for the spirits leading in their lives and others as they desire to hear from you. Um, in Spain and to reach North Africans this coming year. We pray for grace with one another as we make many uh, new transitions and we pray for the Fox family in those transitions in the next few months. And we pray for um, a good pregnancy for Sarah and healthy birth of their coming baby. We pray for wisdom and grace as they parent their two-year-old daughter Radiance. And we pray that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding that they may discern the things that are excellent in your sight. And God, we just take a moment to pray for our country right now, and we just speak peace. Um, and God, we know that you sit with the oppressed, and we know that you tell us to pray for our leaders. So we just cover our leaders right now. And yeah, that in Jesus' name, we speak peace over this country. Um, and we just speak that your will be done according to your original design. And Lord, just um, show us how to love each other better, how to be better neighbors to one another, and how to really contribute to the world in these trying times. We pray all of this in your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning we want to continue our series in the book of Acts that we're calling World Changers. And you know, I thought, isn't it interesting what's being discovered today about how the coronavirus got started and how it's begun to spread throughout the world? You know, Fox News reported just last week that the Wuhan labs have now collected over, over 4,000 different strains of this coronavirus. And in their so-called research, these labs have deliberately engineered and altered what they're now calling the COVID-19 virus so that it specifically is able to penetrate and infect the human cell and do damage to the body. So as I was thinking about that this past week, the thought crossed my mind. So could the coronavirus possibly be preparing us for the seal judgments that we read about in the book of Revelation in chapter 6? You know, the seal judgments tell us that, that the human race, a fourth of the human race, is going to be killed, literally, by pestilence and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. 
Now, if you want to wipe out a country, the most effective way to do it, the most cost-effective way to do it, that is, would be through biological or, or virus warfare. You know, unlike nuclear warfare that destroys everything, virus warfare just takes out the people but leaves the schools and the factories and the buildings and the freeways and, and all the resources still intact. So could this coronavirus be taking us one step closer to the reality of the events that we find in the book of Revelation? Well, one thing that the coronavirus pandemic is doing for us, however, is that it is giving us the gift a people's attention. Do you realize today that people are so desperate that they are beginning to reach out to God and looking for spiritual help like they haven't done so in many years? In fact, today the church is becoming even more relevant than ever before. And it's the church that God uses to bring the good news, the message of hope to the nations and to the world. And that brings us this morning to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we have a major turning point in God's kingdom work in the world. In Acts chapter 2, the church is born so that the world might be blessed. And I'd like you to look with me today at the supernatural birth of the church. But before we look at this passage together, let me ask you a question. Can you remember back to the birth of your child or your children or maybe your grandchildren? You know, if you've ever experienced a birth, oh my goodness, it is one of the greatest events of your life. I can remember back to the day that both of my daughters were born. And that was back in the day when we had the VHS tapes and, and we had tape recorders, but they were a little bigger. You couldn't just whip out your phone and use your phone like we do today, but we had to use cameras. And I was there on the scene in the hospital room as each one of our daughters was being born, and I captured that on tape. And I tell you, it is just the birth of a child is literally one of the most awe-inspiring things a person could ever experience. And you know something, in a similar way, what happens in Acts chapter 2, spiritually speaking, is absolutely earth-shaking. I want to share with you, just before we begin looking at this passage in Acts chapter 2, a little comparison, sort of an overview, between what happens in Acts chapter 1 and what we see happening in Acts chapter 2. So let me show you this little comparison. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples are waiting. They're in the upper room waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. He arrives. Here's another one. In Acts chapter 2, the disciples are equipped by Jesus. They're prepared for ministry. They're told about what's going to happen and what they need to do next. But in Acts chapter 2, the disciples are empowered for ministry. The Holy Spirit comes and they have a new ability to serve God and to, and to impact the world. Also in Acts chapter 1, the disciples are held back. They're told to remain, stay in the upper room. In Acts chapter 2, the disciples are sent forth into the world and their ministry begins. Also in Acts 1, we find our Savior Jesus Christ ascending into heaven. But in Acts chapter 2, what happens? The Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples in the upper room. Also in Acts 1, the promise of the Holy Spirit is given to the disciples. But in Acts chapter 2, that very promise is fulfilled by the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. Also in Acts 1, we have the end of the Old Covenant as we understand it. But in Acts chapter 2, we have the beginning of the new covenant through his blood. Also in Acts 1, this is literally the end of the temple and all of the sacrificial system. But in Acts chapter 2, we have the birth of the church. 
So let's look together at this exciting event together. We're going to begin with the reality of the Spirit's coming. You know, as the disciples were there in the upper room, they were expecting something supernatural to happen. And so we read this in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, the Bible tells us that before this supernatural event occurred, the disciples were gathered together. They were in a room, perhaps the same upper room that Jesus had that last communion service with his disciples before going to the cross. And they are gathered in this upper room. And if we just go back to Acts chapter 1 for a moment, in verses 4 and 5, look again at what Jesus had told the disciples to do. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus had told the disciples they were to remain in Jerusalem. And so there they are, right where God wanted them to be, gathered in the upper room, expecting something supernatural to happen. Jesus predicted the Holy Spirit was going to come. In fact, he said that several times during his ministry, but he also repeated it again in the upper room the night before he was crucified. In John chapter 4, 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus told the disciples in the setting of that upper room scene, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, his Spirit, the Spirit of of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not know him, see him, or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So Jesus had promised the disciples that the Holy Spirit would come. He says, remain here in Jerusalem. It's not very many days away. And so the disciples were exactly where Jesus wanted them to be. And you know, what I notice here, just in beginning of Acts chapter 2, is that the Lord began the church with obedient people. He began with obedient people. And you know, isn't it amazing that God seems to do his greatest work when people are obedient? Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And as you think about your life today, I want to ask you the question, would God say you are one of his obedient followers? As you think about your life, do you wait for God to lead you and to guide you? Or do you just go about your business and just do what you think you should do? You know, it's amazing how God accomplishes his greatest work when we are submissive to his spirit, when we wait upon him, when we are obedient to his voice. And that's exactly where we find the disciples here in Acts chapter 2. Right where God wants them to be. Waiting in Jerusalem as Jesus commanded them to wait. Now, it's interesting to note here in verse 1 of Acts chapter 2 that Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke, as, uh, the book of Luke and Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, he tells us in verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, the occasion of the Spirit's coming and the birth of the church was literally at the feast of Pentecost. Now, did you realize that way back in the Old Testament, God prefigured through some of the major feasts of Israel, what he was going to do in the New Testament. For example, in, in Leviticus chapter 23, we find outlined for us three of the major feasts of Israel. And it's amazing how events in the New Testament literally we find to be the fulfillment of what these feasts were symbolizing. 
So, for example, in Leviticus chapter 23, we have the first feast, the Passover. In Leviticus 23, verses 4 and 5, the killing of the Passover lamb predicted the death of Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus died on the cross, he was literally fulfilling all of the symbolism of the Passover. Then there's a second feast, and that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Leviticus 23, verse 6. It is held the day after Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictures the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the first fruits of those who overcome death. And then there's a third feast, and that's the Feast of Pentecost in Leviticus 23, verse 16. Now, the name Pentecost is not found in the Old Testament. It is a New Testament name for what is known as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest. The word Pentecost means 50. And so it was held 50 days after the Passover. And on that particular week, on the day that the church was born, there would have been perhaps a million people in Jerusalem celebrating this Feast of Weeks, now known as Pentecost. There would have been so many people there because obviously this is now about the first week of June. And so the weather is good and people could easily travel. So there were a lot of people crammed into Jerusalem when the events that we're looking at right here in Acts chapter 2 occurred. So everything God was going to accomplish was prefigured in these three major feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Pentecost. God's redemptive story, think about this, was literally laid out thousands of years ago in Leviticus 23. Everything God was going to accomplish was summarized in these three feasts. Well, let's look now at the the event itself, the birth of the early church. And we discover that it was evidenced by the supernatural. And we're going to take a look now at verses 2 through 4. It says, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Well, in verses 2 through 4, there are three specific things I'd like you to notice. First of all, there was when the Spirit came and the church was born, number one, there was an audible evidence. It says, suddenly, abruptly, without warning. They heard a sound. It sounded like a a strange roar of wind. Now, the Greek text literally says it this way, describes this roar as an echoing sound as of mighty wind born violently. In other words, it was like the sound of a, a hurricane or a jet taking off. If you've been at the airport and you, you hear a jet taking off, it was this incredible mighty roar. Several years ago, one of our daughters bought a home right near the John Wayne Airport. And if you've ever been around that area, if you've ever been around visiting someone who lives near that airport, you know that the jets do something very interesting. When they take off, it's not just a slow, gradual ascent, but as soon as they get up up in the air, they begin to go up at an incredible rate all because they want to try to minimize as much as possible the roar and the sound of the jet engines as planes are taking off. Well, the interesting thing about this is that that as they heard this roar, it, it sounded like a mighty wind, but no one's clothes were torn away by a current of air. In fact, it was deathly silent in the room, even though they heard this incredible sound. The next thing we notice in verse 3 is that there was a visible evidence of the coming of the Holy Spirit. It says there appeared what looked like flames of fire entering into the room and then dividing itself up so there was this flame of fire looked like a tongue. 
resting upon each of the heads of the apostles. Absolutely amazing. And then in verse 4, there is oral evidence of this supernatural event. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began speaking in other tongues. And the word for other there is a very important word. It means another of the same kind. In other words, before the Spirit came, the disciples all spoke one language. But after he came, from their tongues, from their own voices, were coming other languages. In other words, people suddenly began to hear these monolingual Galilean speaking in languages and dialects that they had never learned and they'd never perhaps even heard before. All of that happen happening at the birth of the church. Now what I want you to take a look with me at is we've looked at the reality of the Spirit's coming. But let's look also at the reaction of the Spirit's coming. First of all, there was a certain amount of confusion followed by amazement. We pick up the story now in verse 5 of Acts chapter 2. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Well, let's just stop there for just a moment. The Bible says that when these disciples began to, to move out of the upper room, they were speaking in other languages, and at first the people were bewildered. It says they heard what was happening, and they ran to investigate, and they were confused by this event. It says the people were amazed, and they marveled. Why? Because these monolingual Galileans were actually speaking fluently in other people's language, and this was unheard of. I mean, this was amazing. See, the, you have to remember, the, the region of Galilee was, was kind of like the, the outback region. It's, it's, it's where the, 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 the poor people live. The Galileans were kind of like the farm boys of that day. They were the hicks from the sticks. And all of a sudden, now they are speaking in other languages, and people knew that they were uneducated, where did they get this ability? How was this able to happen? They, could have, they, could have, they would have been able to tell by their accent that they were not from around Jerusalem. They were not from Judea. They were from the northern parts. And now all of a sudden, people are hearing them speaking in their own language, and they are absolutely amazed and marveling. Well, that amazement then led to curiosity in verses 8 to 13. And how is it that we each hear in our own language to which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity saying to one another, what does this mean? Well, the question, how could these men be speaking our languages? They were curious. They wanted an explanation. The people didn't hear gibberish. In fact, in verses 9 through 11, Luke lists more than a dozen foreign languages. That means that some of the disciples perhaps were speaking even in more than one language. Well, the response, as we're going to see, is that some begin to mock. In fact, in verse 13, it says this. But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. In other words, they're saying, oh, I know what it is. I know why they're doing this. They're all drunk. Well, you have to remember, this was probably earlier in the morning. And 
Since when does, does being drunk or filled with alcohol enable people to speak in other languages? Now there was much more, something much more going on than this. But the amazing thing as we look at this story is that as people begin to discover something is happening, something that we can't explain, something we can't understand, at the very heart of it, God received the glory and praise. In fact, in verse 11, it says, they heard the disciples speaking of the mighty deeds of God. The birth of the church was something that God was doing, not men. The church was not man's idea. It was literally God's idea. God launched the church for a specific reason and purpose. And it goes all the way back to Matthew 19. Excuse me, Matthew 29, verses 19 and 20. Something that Jesus said to his disciples right at the end of his ministry. He's passing the baton to them. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How was the Great Commission to be accomplished? How were they to carry out these instructions from Jesus in Matthew 28? The answer is the church. The church was birthed by God to serve as the driving force to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so the, the church began in Acts chapter 2 and was designed by God to be the agent through which the gospel would be taken throughout the world. The church is the entity today that God continues to use in the world to accomplish his plan. And it all goes back to this event right here in Acts chapter 2. Now there's something I'd like to also show you. If you have your Bible with you today, I'd like you to turn to Acts 13. In Acts 13, we see the church in action, literally fulfilling God's intended plan and purpose. And I want you to notice what God moves the church to do. This is a first in the book of Acts. Acts 13, verse 1, now there were an Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Bible says the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Here we see the church in action, being directed by the Holy Spirit to send out the very first missionaries. Did you notice that? God is using the church as a sending body to spread the gospel throughout the world. In other words, there's a direct connection here between the Great Commission in Matthew 28 given by Jesus and the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. In other words, the church was instituted by God as the sending agent for the propagation of the gospel. And for that, God deserves the praise and the glory. You say, well, if, if the gospel was to be launched through the church into the world, then how are we doing? How is this work being carried on? Are we accomplishing anything? Well, I want you to think about this particular fact for just a moment. Do you realize that Christianity grew from 1.5 billion in 1985 to a little more than 2 billion in the year 2000? In other words, think of it this way. This was a growth of about 31 million people annually and a daily average of 86,000. Do you know that's the equivalent of taking the population of Australia 
24.6 million every year and adding it to the church. That's what's been going on just in our time. In fact, today, did you realize that Christianity makes up 32% of the world's population? That's not far from the size of the two next largest religions combined. Islam at 2.3 or 23% and Hinduism at 15%. Christianity is also the only religion represented in all 238 surveyed countries. So literally what started in the upper room in the book of Acts has spread throughout the entire world. You say, well, how are we doing in some of those Muslim-dominated countries? Well, do you realize that every hour, every hour, 667 Muslims are converting to Christianity. Every day, 16,000 Muslims are becoming Christians. Every year, six million Muslims convert to Christianity. In fact, you know, for years, the Jesus film has been taken throughout so many parts of the earth. And it's amazing what God has been doing just through the Jesus film. Did you realize that, that every eight seconds through the showing of that film, every eight seconds somewhere in the world, another person indicates a decision to follow Christ? After watching the Jesus film, do you realize that 10,800 people are coming to Christ every day? 324,000 every month, and 3.8 million every year, just through the Jesus film. Do you know that's like the population of the entire city of Pittsburgh coming to Christ every 28 days? You say, what is God doing in other parts of the world, well, it's absolutely amazing. The gospel continues to spread. People continue to be impacted. And God receives the glory. But that's not all. Did you realize that the supernatural birth of the church is significant for another reason? And that is because when the church was born, it ushered in a new era. Starting with the birth of the church, a new era began. In Acts 2, the ministry of the Holy Spirit changed. Now, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon people to help them accomplish a specific task or mission. But in the Old Testament, unlike the New Testament, after that mission or that task was accomplished, the Holy Spirit left them. His ministry in their lives in the Old Testament was not permanent, but temporary. Once the task was completed, he was gone. That's why David said in the Psalms, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. David loved it when the Holy Spirit would come and rest upon him, and he only desired and wished that the Holy Spirit could have remained permanently part of his life. But in the new era, Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes once and then takes up permanent residence in a believer's life. In other words, the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit comes to live in you personally and permanently. And do you realize that once he comes in, he will never leave you? He is with you until the Lord calls you home. Now, as we think about what happened on the day of Pentecost, it's important for us to also understand today that the disciples in Acts chapter 2, were baptized in the Spirit, verse 3. The baptism of the Spirit means the disciples, and there's a lot of confusion about this idea, the baptism of the Spirit today among evangelical believers. What is the baptism of the Spirit? It's, it's defined for us right here in Acts chapter 2. The baptism of the Spirit means the disciples were placed into the body of Christ. It's that event that marks the beginning of the church. It says they were also filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in other tongues. In other words, Pentecost was a very unusual, unique situation. 
God was doing something unique and special and different. You say, well, what about today? When a person receives Christ at salvation, at the moment they believe, the Bible teaches they are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church. What does the word baptize mean? It means to place into. It's a term that was often used in, in, in everyday life in the first century, especially among those who, who died clothes for a living. And so they would, they would take a, a piece of material and they would place it into a vat or into a barrel and they would baptize, they would place it into the dye and completely submerge it, and when they pulled it out, it would be a different color. That's the word baptism. It means to be placed into, to be dipped into. And so when a person receives Christ, they are baptized in the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that, spiritually speaking, they are placed into the body of Christ. They become a part of His family. They become a member of the family. That's what was happening to the disciples. When the Spirit came, they were being placed into the church as the very first members of the church. When you become a Christian, do you realize you are baptized, placed into the church, and you receive the Holy Spirit, and at salvation, you receive all of the Holy Spirit and His power you will ever need. The question for the believer today is not, have you been baptized with the Spirit? But rather, have you been filled with the Spirit? I want to show you what I'm talking about. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18 is a passage that reminds us of our responsibility today. It says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And that phrase, be filled, is literally a present tense verb. In other words, it's the idea of keep on being repeatedly filled. The question is not, do I have all of the Holy Spirit? The answer is, yes, you do. The more important question is, does the Holy Spirit have all of you? Are you surrendered to Him? Are you allowing His Spirit to fill you all of the time? You see, that's what God is looking for in our lives, that the Holy Spirit is in control. We're not in control. He's in control. And as we submit our lives to Him, as He fills us, then the ministry of the Holy Spirit, oh, it's amazing. What does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts us. He guides us. He leads us. There are so many things that the Holy Spirit does. When we are rightly related to Him, when we're filled, submitted to the Spirit, God can do some amazing things. But notice, once again, what we see the Holy Spirit doing in the book of Acts. I want to go once again, if you, maybe you're still there, in Acts 13. And I want you to see verse 4. Remember, the Holy Spirit said to the church in Antioch, Send out Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have for them. And then it says in verse 4, their response. So being sent out, notice, by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Notice, they were sent out, yes, by the church, from the church, but the Holy Spirit is the literally identified as the one who's doing the sending. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks and guides and directs the affairs of the church and of believers individually. The Holy Spirit in Acts 13 becomes the mouthpiece of God in the church. But that's certainly not all he does. He's also our comforter. He's also our teacher. He is also the one who empowers us for ministry and service. And that brings us, finally today, to our response. If the church of God is the agent for spreading the gospel and the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it all happen, then what's the game plan? How do we do it? I'd like you to come back with me to the book of Acts, to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I like to think of this as God's game plan for the church. 
These are the marching orders of the church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. In this passage, I want you to notice God's plan is to extend, to take the gospel into four specific spheres. Look at it again. Jerusalem, there's one. Judea is another one. Then Samaria. And finally, all the earth. Now, let's look at this a little bit more closely. How did God design the church to function? What is God wanting the church to accomplish? Well, first of all, Jesus said he wants us to take the gospel to Jerusalem. In other words, we need to take the gospel locally. We need to go right to our own backyards. Start where you are, Jesus said. And that's why here at Celebration Church, we have a number of ministries that we are doing right here in our community, in the cities of Santa Ana and Orange. One of, all, one of those ministries, as many of you know, is Laundry Love. If you haven't heard of that before, if you're new to Celebration Church, one of the things we do with Laundry Love is, is we are going to laundry mats. And we are taking with us rolls of quarters. And so many of you, how we thank you and appreciate you've been giving us your spare change. And all of that spare change that you give us goes to Laundry Love. We convert it into quarters. And we approach people at Laundry Love and say, could we pay to have your laundry washed today? And oftentimes people are so receptive, so appreciative. And as their clothes are being washed, interesting, people don't have any place to go. They just kind of have to hang around and they're bored to death. And so it's a perfect opportunity for our teams then to say, is there anything going on in your life right now for which you would like prayer? And how the Lord begins to open doors of people that we can pray for. Do you know we've had people come to know Jesus through Laundry Love and they've been a part, they've become a part of Celebration Church. That's just one of the things that we're doing. Then through our Cambodian ministry, we're taking food to Cambodian Muslims and Buddhists, building friendships with those people. And do you know that we have seen Two people already come to know Jesus as their Savior from South Santa Ana. They've been baptized, and they're now part of our Cambodian congregation. And then we've also worked with international students at Santa Ana College. Also, we've had several summers where we've been able to put on a vacation Bible school program for children. But we don't hold that here at the church. We hold that in a parking lot in the middle of Santa Ana. Why? Because we want to go to where the people are. We want to touch our community. We want to make a difference right in our own backyard. Then we're working with another ministry called Accountability Brothers, where we are helping to take those men who have just gotten out of jail and prison, and we're beginning to work with them. They're coming to know Jesus. They're being discipled. And then in the future, we're looking forward to one day being able to open our own immigration office right here at Celebration Church. Why do we do that? Because all of these different ministry opportunities open the door for us to be able to share the gospel and see people come to know Jesus as their Savior. So Jesus said, start with Jerusalem. Start locally in your own backyard, but don't stop there. Secondly, he said, we're to be involved in Judea. We are to impact people regionally. The gospel needs to spread beyond our city. And that's why as a church we are interested in launching and planting other churches in Orange County and in Southern California. Do you know right now, even as we speak, the plans are being laid for us to begin another Cambodian congregation from Celebration Church that we are looking forward to starting next year, 2021, in Cambodia town in Long Beach. Do you know there are 40,000 Cambodians living in one particular area of Long Beach? It's now been designated called Cambodia town. 
and Pastor Sun Lee Goy is going to be taking a group of people and next year launching a brand new church in Cambodia town. So Jesus said, take the gospel into Judea. There needs to be a regional impact. And then thirdly, he says, in Samaria. And in Samaria reminds us that we have a cross-cultural responsibility. You see, the Samaritans were a different ethnic group of people from the Jews. And God said, I want to reach them as well. You know, people who come and visit our church for the first time are often amazed when they see some of our signage, uh, helping people to, to know where various things are here in our facility. And they happen to notice that all of our signs here at Celebration Church are in three languages, English, Spanish, and Cambodian. You say, why do we do that? Because when people come here, when they attend Celebration Church, we want them to feel like this is their church, because it is. It's not just our church, it's their church. The church of celebration exists right here in this community to be a church for the nations. And so whenever an a, a ethnic group comes and it becomes part of our church, we want them to have signs in their language because that communicates that this is their church and that this church, Celebration Church, is there for them. So we have a cross-cultural responsibility. And then finally, number four, Jesus said, take the gospel to the remotest part of the earth. And that means our vision must be a global vision. Yes, we're concerned about the local. We're concerned about the community and about the region. But we also need to be thinking globally. That's why we are heavily involved and invested in world missions. You see, this isn't just a vision that God has given to Celebration Church. This should be the vision of every single church. And so I want to just share with you just for a moment just a couple of things that that the Alliance, we are as a church, we are part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, which is the same denomination, the same organization, the same umbrella that also covers Town and Country Manor. So Town and Country Manor and Celebration Church are both a part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. I want to just show you some of the exciting things that are happening in the world today just through the ministry of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. First of all, did you know that every four minutes, someone somewhere in the world prays to receive Jesus Christ as Savior through the Christian and Missionary Alliance. One person every four minutes. Imagine that. Here's another one. Did you know that every hour, three patients with various physical needs, and particularly many of them with AIDS, are receiving medical care through the hospitals and through the doctors and through the medical teams of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Here's another one. Did you know that every week, 3,000 new Alliance believers are baptized? Every week, just through the Alliance. 3,000 people somewhere in the world are being baptized and becoming part of the Alliance. And then here's another one. Every month, 250 churches are joining the Alliance family. I mean, that's just incredibly exciting. That means that that churches are are being planted. God is raising up churches in other countries, in other cultures, in other languages. 250 churches join the Alliance worldwide every month. And here's another one. Oh, this is amazing. Every year, 10,000 students are being trained and equipped for ministry through our 125 overseas alliance schools. So there's a lot that God is doing. Planting churches, people coming to know Christ, those with physical needs are are being ministered to. Those who God is calling into ministry are being raised up and they're being trained. The alliance is doing uh, uh, so many things overseas. But as I said before, this isn't just God's plan 
for Celebration Church. This is his plan for every church. And it all starts with us. Right where we are. How does God want to use you to reach out and impact the neighbors who are living around you? Perhaps it's someone who's, who living, who's living, if you're at Town and Country Manor, just across the hall. Or maybe down the hall. Who are you seeking to influence for Jesus Christ today? God wants you to love people into his kingdom. So from the supernatural birth of the church in Acts 2, God is continuing to reach people today. And he's using people just like you and I to accomplish his great worldwide mission. It's happening locally. It's happening regionally. It's happening cross-culturally. And it's happening globally. And how exciting to think that God is, while he's using us right here in Santa Ana, California, he is also using others throughout the entire world. And it all happened. It all began because of the supernatural birth of the church right here in Acts chapter 2. I want to give you a challenge for this week. Who does God want you to love and reach out to in some practical way this week? Who can you touch? How can God's love flow through you into the lives of others? You know something? God has designed us not to be reservoirs who take and keep and receive all this stuff. God has designed us rather to be rivers through whom His Spirit and His love continues to flow out from us into the lives of others. Let's be rivers of His love this week. Well, thank you for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you again next week here at Celebration Church. Uh, let's close with our benediction, and I just ask that you would receive this benediction today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace.